Vaya contigo, amigo. What's that mean? Go with God. You're listening to The Rock God Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Rock God Podcast, the only podcast that talks to rock and heavy metal musicians and artists about their thoughts or opinions about God. I'm your host, David Locklear, the owner and head writer at heavy-vinyl.com. Today we are talking to Chris Aiken. Chris, for more than 20 years, has co-hosted the popular online talk show, The Classic Metal Show, with his friend Wendell Neely. In addition to being a world-class interviewer, speaking with hundreds of well-known musicians, he also owns and operates two businesses, Pinball PA and Aiken IT. He's also the author of a dozen books, including the Cause and Effect series, which focuses on Metallica, Judas Priest, and Motley Crue, as well as Little Victories, Other Things I Should Not Say, and his one called Call Me Chris, which he details an industrial burn accident that almost ended his life. Today, Chris talks to Rock God about his burn recovery, divorce, and how he received his associate's degree in biblical studies as a means of avoiding educational responsibilities. And just as a side note, on this episode, we will showcase the local North Carolina band Lords of Mace as the music that bookends this interview.
is Chris. Hey, Chris, it's David from the Rock God Podcast. How are you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. I, uh, good gosh, actually, I just got done watching the, um, have you seen that celebrity video of all the celebrities singing Imagine by John Lennon? I heard about it, but I have not watched it, no. Holy shit. It it was pretty brutal to watch. I was killing a few minutes, <laughs> and oh my god, <laughs> it's pretty rough. <laughs> Yeah, I've been I've been avoiding all celebrity anything since this Corona thing started. I I really couldn't care less what they have to say and their their false their false sense of oh, we care about you. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of hard to take seriously when you know they're they don't have to worry about a, a business possibly uh, going under uh, because yeah. they can't go in to actually work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, you you want you want to do something? Don't sing. Imagine throw me a hundred thousand dollars to keep my business alive. Right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, that reminds me. You've got um, what pinball PA, and uh, it, mm-hmm. I imagine that that's got to be taking a beating right now. Oh yeah. Well, I'm. I mean, probably I've probably lost. I don't know, ten grand or something since it's since this all started. But you know. You know what, though, man, and this is the honest to God's truth. I'm not worrying about any of it. You know, it's it's going to be what it's going to be. I, I've never tied myself as, like, my lifeblood is my business or any of that stuff. And I've been through worse, as you're well aware. So, mm-hmm. you know, if look, the, the government's not going to let everybody be homeless. The government's not going to let everybody lose their business. So... It's all going to be what it's going to be, and you know, if I lose my business in the in the mix of it, well, then I guess I'll do something else. You know, I mean, it's you can't worry about it. People that are freaking out right now are they're not helping anything. So I, I'm just, am I taking a beating? Of course, but you know, is what it is. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like right now, my wife, she has a. Uh, She's a mental health counselor and, um, you know, we've had to shutter the, the office itself and it's, it's been tricky, but we've been able to do stuff, you know, through the computer, through this thing called telehealth. And so right. it's been easier than I expected, but I mean, it's, it's still tricky. Like we're still going to have to this afternoon go through, you know, expense reports and start trying to figure out where we can cut corners to make sure we hit payroll and whatnot. So it's stressful, but I I feel kind of like, yeah, it, it could be a hell of a lot worse for us. So I'm I'm glad we have options, but man, everybody's taking a serious beating. Well, that's it. You know, and, and that's the whole thing is there's no, there is no magic pill with this thing. There's no, there's nobody that's not taking a beating. I don't think, I mean, I think everybody, everybody is getting their ass kicked and, so you just have to look at it and say, it's not just me. It's not just my business. It's not even just my state. It's everybody in the world yeah. is taking a beating. So, you know, it'll all, it'll either stabilize or it won't. We're either going to, we're either going to recover from it or we're going to go Mad Max or something in the middle. But, you know, today I'm not going to worry about it. Maybe tomorrow I'll have to, but you know, I'm, because I've gotten through stuff in the past, I think I'm way more optimistic than most people that I can pretty much get through anything. Right, yeah. I know my, my father was actually telling me about the um, the gas shortages in the 70s before I, w- I was born in 75, but he okay. was telling me about, you know, having to push his car that was out of gas two miles to, you know, to get the gas and... He's like, sure. yeah, you know, this stuff happens. You'll get through it. It'll be fine, you know. So he's he's real helpful in terms of you know making sure I keep a positive attitude. Yeah, well, and I remember I'm 51, so uh, I remember I was probably 10, but my dad was a truck driver, so I certainly remember the gas shortages because it was a nightmare for him. But you know, he was home a lot, and we ate a lot more hot dogs than we did steak. But <laughs> you know, you, you made it through. It's and everybody will make it through this. This isn't. You know, the way I'm looking at it is, you know, it, our our grandfathers got yanked off to war. We have to sit on the couch. I think <laughs> right. I'll take that. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Binge watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a uh, a much easier thing to take than actually having to go into war and make sure that you don't get killed. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, it, it, there's worse things could happen. And, 
it's going to be what it's going to be. There's no sense in freaking out about it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, that's And that's the thing I'm trying to do. I, my poor wife, you know, she's she's really scared because this is her baby. And so I, I feel like it's kind of my job to just let her tell me the things that she's worried about, not try to fix it, and just sort of be there to be like, hey, things are going to be okay. You know, this is just another thing that we have to overcome. And that's, I mean, there's no, I, I tell my kids this all the time. Worrying has never solved a problem in it, ever. It, yeah. You know, what, what solves problems is, is actually just kind of rolling with it and adjusting to what you're dealt. You know, is everything going to be different for a while? Sure it is. You know, it's, and, and change is scary to a lot of people, but you know, if you just kind of roll with it, there's going to be ways to fix what you can fix. And, you know, and, and, and worry, worrying about it today isn't going to isn't going to make the virus go away to where you can go back to work tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So your your best bet is to just kind of ride it out and see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd gotten advice years ago from when I was uh, selling insurance. One of the guys that I worked with, um, he was probably in his 50s. And that was the best piece of advice he gave me was that he's like, hey, you know, if this if this doesn't pan out, you'll do something else. It's not the end of the world. Things are not going to just stop moving because you didn't succeed at this. You'll succeed at something else. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that, that, dude, I, I mean, I, I've worked before I, before I started my businesses and everything else, I've worked every garbage job that there was to work. <laughs> you know, I've, I've done, I, and when I say every garbage job, I've done everything from counting screws in a factory to, cremating bodies and everything in between. So, you know, if none of that got to me, this isn't going to get to me. You just keep driving forward. There's always something else to do. And if you're hungry, if you're hungry to, for success, you'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, you talking about doing all kinds of different jobs. I can imagine that you might be the type of guy that probably got fired a lot. Would I be incorrect in saying that? Oh. Oh, no, you would not be incorrect about that. I got <laughs> fired from many, many jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been fired from a couple, but uh, it, it's. Uh, I, I think everybody should be fired at least once just to sort of know what what they're up against and what they can or cannot do, you know, just sort of to learn parameters in some sort of way and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, and I've, you know, uh, anybody that knows my history even a little bit, I didn't become quote unquote angry Aiken. I've always sort of been that guy and I've always been rebellious against authority. And I've always been, you know, the, the guy that actually strikes back against everything. So yeah, people telling me what to do in jobs, it was never, was never, never a good fit. I mean, I, I, I used to work at a, um, an insurance company and I, I was working on the help desk and, we we had a consultant that came in that I had to work with that worked on our trouble ticketing system mm-hmm. and she was a she was an independent consultant and I used to have to work with her, you know, one on one and I used to tell her all the time I was like, You're doing exactly what I want to do And she was like, Well what's that? It's like working without a boss. Mm. She was like and as she said to me a hundred times, she's like, It's not that easy, it's not that easy, it's a lot harder than you think. And I kept telling her, I was like, you know, maybe it is harder than I think, but it's still better than working for somebody. Yeah. And when the opportunity came, man, I took it and I have not looked back. I mean, I've been independently employed now for since 2000 and 2006, I think. So, you know, and I, I haven't had to work in a cubicle sense and I don't regret it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Even in these kind of really difficult times where you see how much you know money is being lost and how difficult it is to get over some of these mountains it's like it i agree it's still much better than having to you know ask permission from somebody to do x y and z yeah well and and for for me you know i mean i have two businesses i have i have pinball pa which is kind of my fun business and then i have aiken it services which is building apps and building websites and doing computer work and that kind of stuff and and Pinball PA is shut down, but Aiken IT, obviously everybody's working from home. So 
my phone is still ringing there, which is good. You know, the, but the, the unique thing is from starting Aiken IT, which I did first, the one lesson that I've learned is that there's always somebody looking to give somebody else money. There always is. Mm -hmm. As long as you have skills and you, and you're easy to deal with and you're not hard to get a hold of, there's always somebody willing to give you money. So, you know, for me personally, I have, I have no fear of it. You know, we're shut. We're, I'll give you an example. It, it, it all comes down to how hard you want it and how much you want to do something. We're obviously all on quarantine right now with the, with the coronavirus thing. Mm -hmm. Well, 99% of people are sitting at home watching Netflix and not doing anything or, you know, they're trying to telecommute, but if they're off, they're just off. They're just taking a break and not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I've all during this time off, I taught myself how to build an app for a Roku and how to build an app for Amazon. And I launched them both and they're both live now for classic metal show. And ah. it's like, you know, I looked at this as not dead time, but here's an opportunity for me to, to do something and learn something that once the virus scare starts going away, I'm going to have a new skill that I can sell to a lot of people that are going to, that are going to realize from this virus that they need new ways to reach out to their, to their audience, to their fan base, to their customers. And now I can offer that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all about, it's always about looking forward, not looking backward, not oh poor me -ing, and just kind of, you know, driving forward. And that's, that's what I've always chosen to do. Yeah. Yeah, like even I, I agree with me. Even I've been trying to work on my website, even though I don't really make much money selling records and whatnot. I enjoy sure. doing it, and so it's been an opportunity for me to kind of uh, you know fine tune some of the things there. My wife has kind of figured out certain ways of how can we make money by you know letting her see clients over you know the internet. Is this something that we could utilize in the future? You know, something that could be a, a long term money maker you know, for, and which sounds nasty when you're talking about, you know, doing mental health counseling, but it's still a business. And, you know, it's still one of those things where you still, you have to look to how am I going to meet the bills? And these are some of the things that we've looked at. And it looks like there's a, you know, a strong possibility like what you did that we could have some options for people that maybe couldn't get out beforehand, you know, maybe right. shut-ins or someone who is, uh, you know, mentally or physically incapable of coming out of the house. These are ways that we can help them. And it's, I, 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 that's the way I look at it is that, you know, there's an opportunity to actually better yourself, better your business and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, in late at night, you can binge watch stuff if you want to. I just don't see watching TV all day as an option. Right. No, exactly right. And, uh, and I'm a hundred percent with you. I'm going to use this time to build new things and to do new things and to, to make sure that when the light switch gets turned back on for the world, that I'm already, you know, as far to the forefront of it as I can be. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I think that's about the best way you can make sure that you have a secure future. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't think of it that way. I, I think so many people are just sort of dependent on what others are going to tell them to do or not to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think most people, are tuned their their lives are tuned to be in reactionary you know their 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 whole structure is well i need to make money so i'll get a second job or i need a babysitter so i'll call somebody you know i'll call somebody i haven't spoken to before or whatever you know I, with you know because i've been through you know especially with the burn accident i had to be very i had to learn very quickly to be proactive with everything. Mm -hmm. I had to not wait till the doctors told me how to heal. I had to, I had to, I had to go forward. I had to jump into things. I had to do things without waiting. And the fact that, that I kind of did that is the reason that I've been able to do everything since, you know, I, I, I mean, I've been an independent business person for years now. And the reason I was able to do it was because I started this business at a time that nobody would start a business. I started my, this is such a silly story. I started Aiken IT Services. I got fired from my very last job that I had 
for, you know, for being me. You know, I, <laughs> I ended up getting fired. And um, they gave me, they gave us, they gave me two weeks severance pay, and that was it. So I had two weeks of severance pay and $320 in the bank. And I came home, and my, my ex-wife said to me, she's like, okay, well, let's get your resume together. Let's get it online. Let's do whatever. Because, you know, she had been through it with me before. And I was like, nope, not this time. I was like, I'm starting my own business. And we might be homeless in three months, but this is the way it is, and this is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know and, and, and it was a huge risk. I mean, I had kids and everything else and a mortgage and all that other stuff, and I had nothing. I had, you know, like I said, $320, two weeks of pay, so maybe two grand. You know, and I was like... This is how I'm going to roll. And I fought and I worked hard and I just kept driving and, you know, I made it through it. I was able to make this business a success. But then I started the other business and made that a success. You know, it's, it's again, it's, it's all about stepping forward, continually moving, continually walking straight forward instead of looking back to see what you missed, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like for you even, it was... Uh, coming off of a, that really bad burn accident. And I mean, that's even more impressive that I guess that the fact that you came from, you know, such a death defying event that on mm-hmm. some level you were able to utilize that energy of I'm going to survive into, you know, something as less death defying as I'm going to start a business and survive. Well, you know, the, the thing with the burn accident, and, you know, I'll, I'll tell the story real quick. I was working in a steel mill, and um, I was working in front of a furnace, and the furnace blew up, and I got um, 69% burns, 52% third degree with grafts. Um, you know, I was, I was in a coma for, for about a month. I was in the hospital for two months. I was in rehab, relearning to use my fingers and walk and do, you know, regular stuff for 14 months, 22 surgeries. You know, I mean, it was nasty. I was dead at one point on the table. They had to shock me back. So, you know, I've been through the war. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I knew how to do was fight. And I fought every step of the way getting getting through the burn accident. You know, it was it was never there was never a time that I was like, oh, poor me. How could this happen to me? Why, why is it me? It was always, it was always, I got to get back to normal. Here's what I got to do to get back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I fought, I fought and I fought and I did get better. And I got, you know, I beat every odd that I was supposed to beat. They were supposed to amputate my arm. They were going to amputate fingers. They were, they told me that I was never going to walk again, except with a four prong walker. Mm -hmm. And I beat all of that stuff. You know, I, I, I still have my, all my fingers, all my toes, my hands, my arms, you know, I walk fine, you know, I, I beat every odd. Well, what ended up happening was at the end of that, at the end of that, um, rehab, once I was deemed quote unquote better, I, um, I didn't know what to do. You know, I was so busy. I was so busy 24 hours a day that even when I got a job, that was nowhere near enough for me. You know, I, I got my first job in IT after I got hurt. And, you know, I was working, uh, was like, like work at 6.30 to 2.30 in, you know, morning to afternoon. Mm-hmm. And I got off at 3 o'clock, I was like, well, what the hell do I do now? I've got, like, all this time that I'm used to working and I'm used to being productive. Mm-hmm. So... I, and, and that's when everything started from there. I started, um, I started writing for a local magazine here in, in Cleveland called scene magazine. And I was one of their most prolific writers, but that wasn't enough for me. So I started my own magazine because I just didn't feel like they were giving me enough at scene. Yeah. So I started, I started my own and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm the editor, I'm the writer, I'm the, you know, I'm everything. I'm, I'm teaching myself how to do you know, professional layout and, you know, that kind of thing. And while I was doing that, I was paying a guy to do my website. Well, that seemed like a stupid expense to me. (laughs) So then I taught myself how to do websites. And then I turned that into a business, which became Aiken IT. And, 
And somewhere in there, I started doing commercial radio because, you know, I still didn't feel fulfilled enough. And I, I just kept adding and kept adding and kept adding. And, you know, I've, I, I got burned up in 19, the end of 94 and I went back to work in 98 and I've never not had two jobs since never, mm -hmm. you know, it, and sometimes I've had three, sometimes even four. You know, there was there was a time where I was where I was working my day job. Then I would come home and I would the layout of the of the magazine, Music's Bottom Line, until Sunday night. Then I would go and do the the radio show that I had at the time, which is called the Metal Show on WMMS here in Cleveland. And somewhere in there, I was also that's when I I started appearing on the Classic Metal Show as well. So at, at that point, I was working four different things at the same time. And I never felt like that was a burden or overbearing or anything. I always felt like that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. So and I, in a weird way, you enjoy it, even though it's busy as hell. You still like yeah, it. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's because it's on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I say it to people all the time because I get a lot of my friends, you know, a lot of my friends, especially when I cancel on stuff, because I always put work first. I will, you know, if I have concert tickets and I've got an emergency project with somebody, the co the concert just I just eat the tickets mm -hmm. because my work is always first. And you know, my friends are always like, "You're working too hard. You're working too much. You're working eighteen hours a day." Blah blah blah. And my answer is always the same: It's I would rather work eighteen hours a day for myself than eight hours a day for anybody else. <laughs> right. And I'll, and I'll never give that up. I I I can't fathom going back to having short hair and a tie and sitting in a cubicle answering phones or whatever. That just does not suit me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. I, I worked enough shit jobs that I know that even though I'm busy and I'm stressed and I'm worried constantly that I would rather mm -hmm. do that than come home and dick around on my phone and then go back to work for somebody who may or may not care about my well being and could let me go in a heartbeat. Well, and that there's, you know, there, there's a, there's a saying that, that goes out there today that there's no loyalty in business and there's not, you know, I mean, you can be the best worker at your company, at your job and be fired immediately for no other reason than they can get somebody to do almost the same job, but for half the price. Mm -hmm. And it, and it just sucks. I mean, it, it literally, it is so defeatist to think that you would put in your best effort and, and you could be replaced so easily, you know, by, by somebody that has not, not proven at all that they can do what you do, but that is the nature of business. You know, in, in my businesses that I have now, I work as hard as anybody. I mean, I'll work day, night. I don't care what time it is. You know, my, my job is to get my, my customers happy and my customers are extremely loyal to me because of that because but but in the end they could leave but mm -hmm. i know one thing i can't get fired i cannot get fired because there's nobody that's going to replace there's no way in hell i'm going to replace me with somebody else it's <laughs> right. not going to happen <laughs> yeah that's the, that's definitely the the upside of of having your own business and you know and what's uh -huh. weird is that i almost understand when uh i hear about a, a business going going well i got to replace this guy because it's going to cost half as much to get somebody else to come in and do his same job. But at the same time, mm -hmm. we're also looking at it would, it's, you've got to really look at the benefit of having a good employee, somebody who will go to the mat mm -hmm. for you and how much right. that is worth versus, okay, I can get somebody for half as much who is going to be kind of a dickhead and not do nearly as well as this guy will. Right. Well, and you know, it's funny. Again, everything is a life lesson, I guess, but I was working, I was working at a company working help desk and there's, there's a convention every year. It's called the HDI help desk Institute, um, analyst of the year thing. And it's a national thing. And like 5,000 people end up being part of this thing. And I was entered in it one year and I ended up finishing second. I didn't win, but I finished second. And then, you know, a big accomplishment. It was a huge accomplishment for my company. And so I came back and two weeks later, I was, um, I, I had my performance review at the company 
and I had a maxed out, you know, you know how they grade you for your, for your performance every mm-hmm. year. And I had mine completely maxed out at every box check. Perfect, re- perfect score. And I got told, well, we're going to give you this raise. This is the last raise you're ever going to get because you've maxed out the money for that position. And you're not corporate enough for us to move you into management. Mm. So this is as far as we go. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, I, I was like, what more do I have to do to prove that I'm the best at this job? Mm-hmm. You know, and and literally I, I, I left two weeks later. I was like, <laughs> you know what? I can go find another job. And I did, and I left, and I found another job, and then that the next job ended up being the last one I ever did for, for for working with somebody else, and you know, it, it it just, and that's where I got this whole thing about companies never being loyal. You know, I felt terribly betrayed by that, and I just couldn't figure out how you could let the person that literally was the best employee in the company go. It made no sense to me. It still doesn't make sense to me, and. You know, I, since then I'll just be my own best employee, and it keeps me it keeps me on keeps a roof over my head and keeps my refrigerator somewhat filled. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing. Is like you you kind of look at the fridge and you're going, well, yeah, the other job I, I did have more shit in here, but you know what? I earned every bit of this that's in the fridge. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, and and I mean, I'm joking. I, I make I make plenty of money. I don't worry about. I'm not a money guy. I don't, I don't really sweat money a whole lot, but you know, I just kind of, I just kind of don't want to work for somebody else. It just, it just does not suit me anymore. That's, that's my biggest fear of the coronavirus is that nothing will come back. And then all of a sudden I'm going to have to, you know, greet at Walmart or something. I'm just like, Oh, I don't know that I could do that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That would be a brutal downfall. I believe. Um, I, I think I'm okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure once things come back, a guy with a resume of running two businesses successfully for 15 years could probably get a mid-level management job if I had to. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're not going to be homeless. It might suck, but you uh, won't be homeless. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll I'll cry that I have to cut my hair, but other than that, that's about <laughs> it. Well, I, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, uh, you know, your burn accident. Um, the yeah. uh, that happened. Uh, it was an, an industrial accident. Can you explain, you know, the details behind what really, uh, you know, led up to to that accident? What the, you know, the terrible things that happened there. Sure. Um, yeah, I was I was working as a furnace melter. It was um, it was at a company. I can't say the company name for legal reasons, but um, the company made um copper and mostly copper stuff for for companies that make pipes and um uh fixtures for bathrooms and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so so i was working in front of a furnace it was it had seven tons of of molten molten metal in it molten copper and i was i was finishing up the night and I was I, I was instructed by our furnace supervisor to do what we call piping the furnace, which is when we would take samples off of the metal and you could run it through a computer and tell you that you you had you know too much iron in it or too much aluminum in it or something like that. And in on this particular night, I was I it had I think too much aluminum on in the in the mix. And so what we would do is we would take an air pipe and we put it down into the molten, like stick it through a hole in the door of the furnace. And then you would, you would turn on air and you would pipe out, you know, you would, you would oxidize the aluminum out of the mix. Mm -hmm. So I, I went back and I, I did what I was supposed to do as far as clearing the pipe. And I stuck it into the furnace to start piping this stuff. And it just blew up. Um, you know, we, there's never been a clear definition through the OSHA investigation, all that, what happened. Um, the, the thought is that there might've been a little bit of condensation still in the, in the line or in the, in the pipe or something that, that blew into the furnace and, you know, without getting into a whole chemistry lesson, um, you know, water turns to, when water turns to vapor, it expands like a thousand times. Mm -hmm. So, 
water hitting something 2,500 degrees explodes. It just, you know, it, it explodes out. And that's what happened. And I was standing, you know, right in front of the furnace. And, you know, I, I still can, I can still hear the sound of the shit sizzling my skin right off. Jeez. I mean, I just, cause I, I didn't black out. That's the weird, the unfortunate weird thing. Although it doesn't scare me anymore, but I just, it, it sounded like just what you would expect if you took a white hot skillet and just dropped eggs on it or just poured water on it. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it was like, whew. It was brutal, and it, it, the explosion was so forceful, it threw me back about 20 feet or so, 20, 30 feet, and I hit my back on a tow motor, and then I got slammed down to the ground. And the first thing I remember was not necessarily hurting from the burns as much as my back hurting because I hit a, you know, I hit a forklift with my, with my back. Oh, damn. And, and so I got up, I stood up, and... And I, I couldn't move anything. Everything was all stiff and whatever. And I looked down at my right hand and I saw the bones in my hand and the skin and the tendons and shit all rolled back on my hand. And I was like, oh, man, this is bad. You know, I was like, Ooh, <laughs> no shit. This is awful. And, I, and I saw blood squirting everywhere and stuff. And I just was like, I, I started to walk out of the the room i you know i I, and i couldn't really move my legs even i was like what happened here and and i i just yelled out as loud as i could i was like somebody fucking help me you know and and two guys came running in my friend scott and this other guy don and they came in they started beating the hell out of me with their gloves because what i didn't even realize was i was still on fire i didn't even know it and they put me out and they um they led me to an office. They laid a, I don't know, a sheet or a towel or something on the floor. And, you know, and they called paramedics and, you know, instantly I knew it was bad when I saw, you know, I saw people in the office were freaking out and throwing up and just, you know, cause they were freaked out. Cause I was, I mean, all the clothes were burned off. All, a lot of the skin was burned off blood everywhere. Mm. It was a mess. And, um, yeah. And so, you know, the paramedics ended up showing up, took me right to a helicopter, and they flew me to the the burn unit at Metro Metro Health Hospital in Cleveland. And um, once they got me off the helicopter, I, um, you know, I was screaming at my at my doctor, the doctor at the time who became who was my doctor. I was like, "Don't you fucking let me die! Don't you let me die!" You know, and and he looked me right in the face and he goes. You need to shut up. And I was like, I, and I, and, and I was like, what? And he was like, he's like, if you burn all this energy, you will die. He's like, and I just looked at him and I said, are you going to get me through this? And he goes, I'm going to try to, but you need to shut up. And I was like, <laughs> Hey, and I, and I was like, all right. And I was scared obviously. And you know, and, but I shut up and that's pretty much the last thing I remember for, about a month because I slipped right out. They, they put me under and, you know, took me right in for eight or nine hours of surgery. And, um, I slipped right into the coma and then I was in a coma for weeks. But then, and then I woke up to the, to the horror of, you know, <laughs> of, of being a burned up mess tied to a bed in a hospital for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. It was a, it was a long run, but, but I made it through it, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but th- that's that's really scary as hell. Just the idea that you know what's going on, you know that you're that you didn't go into shock and pass out, that you were completely aware of all that stuff. That would scare the shit out of me. Yeah, you know what, man? It, it it was and it wasn't. You know, there's a there's a part of me. If you would have asked me for the first ten years after after the accident, I would have been right there with you and said said, yeah, I hate that I have these memories. I hate that I remember this. I hate, you know, that, that this is such a vivid experience for me. But after that, once I stopped, once time put distance between it, it really, I mean, I can look and I can see the scars, but other than the scars, you know, it, it almost doesn't seem like it was me anymore. It, it seems like it's a really vivid story that I know, mm-hmm. but it, it, it doesn't, you know, it's not like I see a stove anymore and all of a sudden I get pains in my body or anything like that. You know, it's, 
it, 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 it was like that for a while. There were definitely, I, I couldn't see fireworks for 10 years because oh, wow. every time, every time I heard an explosion, it took me right back to that minute. And somewhere along the way, I was like, I'm not letting this thing be my, be my controller. You know, I, I saw a lot of people that have been through burn accidents or whatever, or, or any accident. And they let it, they let it control their life. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, they, instead of being an individual, they become their accident. They become Joe Smith, who was burned on, bup, 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 mm-hmm. you know, or Mary Johnson, who was in this terrific car crash in whatever time. And I, I don't want to be that guy. I mean, I know you've listened to me on, on the classic metal show. I don't really focus that much on the burn accident. And I've got, I've got accident stories for days, Mm -hmm. but you know, I, I refuse to be that guy. I refuse to let, to let that accident be my defining moment. Right. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that kind of made me relate to that was, uh, my younger brother, he was born with, um, a heart defect and he had open heart surgery when he was like 12 hours old and he had to right. uh he he basically had to go through several surgeries over the next 15 years in order to correct the the heart problems and when he had his second surgery he was i think 11 years old uh it went badly and he went into a coma he had a mild stroke it was the whole we don't know if he's going to make it and he came out of it and we felt like it's what was interesting is that we felt like it was, you know, it is a like a miracle, you know, to us that he came out of it. But what I have found fascinating in the subsequent years is that he also doesn't allow it to be his defining characteristic. And almost in a weird way, it's like the miracle has become almost typical. Like, you know, it's not like in a Hollywood movie where, oh, you came back and you're going to be living on this dopamine high for the rest of your life because you really recovered from this and everyone's going to be inspired. It's like, no, this is just part of who I am now. It doesn't define yeah. me and I'm not going to be getting high on it every day. It's literally uh, almost boring in a weird way. Well, everybody, you know, I, I tell everybody cause I, I get as when, when anybody learns of my accident, it's always that, Oh man, you're so brave. You're so this, you're so that and I'm like, I'm not, you know, everybody goes through something. Everybody goes through, through something in their life, whether it's a, a car accident or a family member that gets killed suddenly or in a violent way or, or whatever it is, you know, everybody goes through something. So one is not worse or better than the other, you know, it's, it, or, or more shocking or anything. It's just what we do as, as human beings. We, we go through stuff and you get to the other side of it. And I think people that have been through major stuff understand it a little bit better than people that don't. But, you know, the last thing any of us wanted was whatever happened to us. The mm-hmm. last thing your, your relative wanted was to have a heart malfunction. The last thing I ever wanted to do was get cooked in a furnace. Right. You know, I mean, that's just the, that's just the way it is. So, to define yourself on the worst possible thing that's going to happen to you just doesn't make a lot of sense for, for me, you know, I'll be honest. I don't even look at my burn accident as nasty as it is, as the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I'll, I'll be deadly honest. I went through a divorce seven years ago that messed with me a whole lot more than the burn accident did, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's the truth is, you know, I was way more mentally screwed from my divorce than I ever was with the burn accident. And, yeah. and, and the, I guess the moral to that is you can't really, you can't really define for any person what moves them or what scares them or what shakes them, you know, because how many, how many more people are there out there that have been through a divorce? There's, you know, a zillion people that have been through a divorce. There's, you know, a handful of us that have been burned to the level that I was burned, but the divorce that, that 99% of the world can relate to is the thing that, that messed with me more. You know, there's, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. You know, I almost feel like, uh, you know, at least maybe for men, I don't know if it would be the same for women, but 
with men, it's like a physical injury has definable goalposts that you can work towards in order to get out of it. But something like a divorce is so kind of fluid and weird and emotional that it's hard to say when it's going to be over. And I think that that takes sort of an exhaustive mental toll more than a physical injury would do. Yeah, well, it does. I, I know for me, the divorce was all mental. I was a mess, you know, and, you know, I had been married. I had been married to my ex from the time I was 19 years old. So I, I really didn't know a whole lot else. You know, I didn't know. I certainly didn't know how to date in 2012 or whatever it was, 2013. You know, I didn't know that. And everywhere I looked, everything I had ever built, every purchase I had ever made as an adult was with her. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I walk around my house and I didn't know, you know, I'd walk around my house and I'd go, oh, she bought that. Oh, she bought that. Instead of just being like, okay, well, how do I move forward? And I got into the same rut that I would imagine most people do, which is they obsess on what they've lost instead of moving forward with the next step of their life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I wrote, I wrote a book. My, my book, Little Victories, was written in real time about my divorce. And it, um, it's a brutal read, you know, but the, the, the pleasantry of it, if there's a such thing, was that at the end of Little Victories, when I finished it, when I closed that book, I mean, literally, I lived the metaphor of I closed that chapter of my life quite, quite literally. And when I was done with that, then I was kind of done with my divorce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and the unique thing is, is that now, you know, I'm great with my kids. I'm, I, I have, I love my life. I love being single. And, I actually get along okay with my ex. You know, I'm, I'm not one of these guys that, you know, every time they mention their ex, they get mad and they, they think bad things and they wish them death or whatever. I, I don't have any of that. You know what I mean? My, my ex and I, you know, we, we talk somewhat often, I guess, you know, every couple of months we have a nice chat. It's always civil. And, you know, it, it's a weird thing is, it, maybe it is what we needed. Who knows, you know? But mm-hmm. at the time, it seemed like, how could this possibly be? How could this be right? How could breaking up be right? And now you look at it, you know, with again, with some distance, it's like, yeah, maybe this was the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I for the, my parents got divorced when I was uh, seven years old, and they hated each other. You know, every time they... My entire childhood, every time they got together, it was just, you know, it was two dogs fighting each other. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, and I resented them for that for a long, long time. And then I came to a realization that I was like, if they hate each other this much, what in the hell makes me think they would have gotten along if they had stayed together? And right. it, it's one of those things where you kind of realize, yeah, maybe it, it is as much as they hated each other. Maybe that was weirdly more healthy for them to be away from each other because uh-huh. of just how nasty it truly was. And, you know, eventually I had, you know, I like after you get out of your adolescence and you kind of realize your parents are adults and they don't really know what they're doing and you kind of have to let shit go. Um, it seemed right. like not long after that, they did kind of start being decent to one another when I was sort of like, eh, who gives a shit? You, you guys are still my parents. I still love you and we'll just move on with our lives. And they seem to be pretty cordial with you, with each other now. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's probably the way, Look, nobody gets married because they hate the other person, or at least I don't think so. Right. You know, on on some level, on some level somewhere, there was there was a um, a definite feeling of love that was strong enough that you felt that it could last forever in a lifetime. Obviously, it doesn't for people that get divorced, but but there's something there, you know, that that made you feel that way, and to to absolutely hate. I personally don't understand it. And, uh, you know, even, even as much as I don't like how everything went down and I, you know, I'm not going to totally get into that, but, but I did like how it went down and I had some real resentment toward her about how it went down. But in the biggest picture, it needed to happen. And, you know, for me, it's, it's it would be incredibly selfish 
to go on an absolute hate, hateful, vindictive rage for the rest of my life against her when she did so much for me in the burn accident. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I wrote about it in Little Victories, man. I was, I was one angry son of a bitch during that time. And I mean, I rightly so. I was dying, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. But um, she put up with all that. Um, and, you know, hard to hate somebody that put their life aside for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, because you do appreciate it, regardless of of what happened. You know, it. I think it shows a level of maturity when you can be like, "Yeah, they they really did come to bat for me, and I appreciate it, regardless of the other shit that happened." Right. Mm-hmm. No, and, and you know, divorce is ugly. It's always ugly. Nobody gets through it unscathed. I don't. The only people that I know that get through a divorce without some kind of real mental anguish are those that, you know, the, the people that are on their fourth and fifth wet marriage and whatnot. <laughs> now, to where it just, it's just like breaking up with a girlfriend, you know, only it's just got some legal paperwork behind it. Yeah. It just seems that really expensive. <clears throat> yeah. But there's a lot of people that just keep rolling the dice. I, I'll never understand that, but you know, that's so be it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I would do that. I mean, I've been married to my wife for 20 years and you know, yeah. if, if we got divorced for any reason, I can't possibly see a scenario in which I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to do that again. I'll never do it. Tw- I'll never do it again. No right. way. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love my freedom. I am absolutely, uh, you know, I, I say it on the show all the time and it's, it comes off somewhat as a joke, but I swear to God, it's deadly serious. In a relationship, in a marriage, in the most successful marriage you would ever find, no matter who that is, you the the number of compromises that you have in a day is more than a single person has in a month. Mm-hmm. It just is, and for me, if 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 I've taken on one terrible habit by being single, it's that I've become immensely selfish with my time and what I want to do. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't push myself to open the door to doing what somebody else wants me to do anymore. You know, I, I didn't like it when I was going through it. My ex-wife used to always say to me that I was not quote unquote, the marrying type. And I shouldn't have got married because of that, because I was definitely selfish with my time. Mm -hmm. And you know what? She's right. You know, in my case, I'm probably one of those guys that should have never got married because, you know, I'm a guy that definitely works on personal achievement. <clears throat> you know, I'm constantly trying to build the like like we were talking about before. I'm constantly trying to build the next thing, trying to build the next business, trying to get the next thing moving. And you can't do that and balance everything else, ba- balance family, balance wife, balance relationship. You can't do it. You've got to, to be successful, you've got to either be all in or, or all out mm-hmm. for me, or, or have a rich relative that, that sponsored you a bunch of money to, to let you have the time. But you know, I don't have that. I only have my, my brain and my two hands and, and that's what, that's what drives me. So, mm-hmm. you know, again, you know, it's funny because I smash everybody on the radio show that calls it trying to promote marriage, but I'm actually not against marriage. <laughs> if you find, if you find somebody and you're willing to make those sacrifices, more power to you. But just go into it knowing that you have to make those sacrifices. It's the people that go into it clueless, and then once they're married, that start bitching about, oh, this is so bad. I never thought it would be this way. Well, who didn't tell you? Mm-hmm. You know, that's the... That's the thought I always have is who, who avoided telling you that this is what marriage is. It's not just, it's just, it's not just a piece of paper to solidify your dating. It's much different than dating. And I think too many people don't understand that. Yeah, I would agree. I I think a lot of people don't, I think a lot of people don't know how to communicate what they need Mm -hmm. in any kind of a relationship. You know, one of the things that I do on a regular basis is I go and hang out with a friend of mine every week. It's like we, you know, we just chill out, we drink beer, we watch movies and whatnot. And the family, uh, they, they don't like it, but they understand it. I kind of explained to them, it's like, if I don't do this, 
I'm going to be a shitty human being running around this house mm-hmm. if if I don't get yeah. that sort of outlet because if all my time is monopolized, that's going to be a problem. And mm-hmm. so they have to kind of they do accept it. Uh, the girls, I mean, they're both very young. They don't like the dad leaves for one night, but they they accept the reality of it. Sure. No, and, and that's exactly it. Is you know, it, it sounds like you might have also found found a uh, you know a spouse that actually understands who you are. You know, one one of the biggest problems that I had in my marriage was we were very uh, in, non compatible, and it got worse as time went on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, I mean. I, I, and I will say, I, I do think that the accident, that the burn accident, kind of ended any chance that we had for having a regular relationship. Mm-hmm. Because after, you know, the one thing with the burn accident was everything had to be focused on me so that I wouldn't die. Yeah. Well, once that ended, I didn't know how to go back to, you know, uh, okay, well, let's make a family decision. Let's plan a family trip. Let's do... You know, all the things that you have to do as a family, you know, I moved on and I started building things and, you know, she wasn't included. She wasn't part of me building, you know, my magazine or my radio career or anything, really. <clears throat> she didn't like that I did the, the, the IT business. She was like, you got to go back to work. You got a family to take care of. I was like, no, nope, not going to happen. No discussion. No, no, you know. No, like like I said before, no compromise. Mm-hmm. It was just I'm this and that's that, and I know what's the best for me because I got through this thing that was so much worse by doing it my way. You know, mm-hmm. it's it, it it really sabotaged. That's the one thing that the accident did take from me was my ability to have, you know, a a symbiotic relationship with 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 my ex wife. It just it just couldn't work after that and. Because of that, she got isolated and she fell ridiculously too far into into the church and into religion to where that became even more of a spike between us because then she started using religion on me as almost a um, a weapon. You know, mm-hmm. it, it was she would <clears throat> she would justify her opinions based on scripture. And, you know, um, for those that don't know, I do have a a degree in religion, so that never was going to work. And I'm certainly not the kind that's going to be like, okay, dear, you're right. The Bible does say this, this, and that, you know, I was always going to be the one to fight back. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to fight with scripture, I'll fight with scripture. And, and, and we had those kind of, those kind of relationship problems. And as you can imagine, it just got deeper and deeper into ugliness Mm -hmm. and, you know, and w- there's only so far, there's only so deep of a hole you can dig before you're, before it starts filling in on you, mm-hmm. you know, and that's kind of what happened. Now, when she started using religion, was, uh, were you an atheist when you guys got married or, you know, what were, not, what were your beliefs? I'm not an atheist now. I'm not an atheist at all. I'm not the most, I'm not the Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday, um, church guy per mm-hmm. se. <clears throat> but I definitely believe in heaven and hell and God and Satan and, you know, the basics uh, of of traditional religion. I grew up, it's funny, because in my family, my my mom and dad never made us go to, they were not church people. They did not go to church at all. And that stemmed from my grandparents on my mom's side were extremely hardcore Catholics, like old-fashioned Catholics, the... <clears throat> the kind where you, you know, you dress up in your Sunday best, so to speak. And, and you, you know, and you go to church and you recite all the, the Lord be with you. And also with you, praise be to God. And also with you, you know, you you recite the, the, the guidance from the, from the pastor as, Mm -hmm. you know, in the church. So they never made me go to church, but I personally was always fascinated with, with religion. Not necessarily church, but I always found the stories to be amazingly cool. You know, and I know that's kind of weird, but I, that's just how I was. I always found, you know, uh, Daniel in the lion's den or the fiery furnace or, you know, 
just the uh, you know the three wise men following the star to some little stupid town in the middle of nowhere to to find the <laughs> you know the lore. You know, <clears throat> you know. I always found those stories to be fascinating. And as a kid, even though I wasn't forced to, I was never forced to. I went to Bible study or Bible school every summer. Um, my first job I ever had was doing landscaping at a church, at a church by my house. And I, I would do landscaping there, and I would set up and tear down for bingo and stuff like that. And I would go to church on Sundays there as well. Um, you know, so I, I was very, I grew up very much in, steeped in religion, but not forced to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, I, I did all the stuff, you know, I, I was baptized numerous times at, at numerous, numerous different, um, churches, you know, because I always wanted to participate and I always wanted to, I always wanted to feel what other people were feeling at the church. So, you know, I, I, I've always had a, I've always had trouble. That's where religion loses me is. I I have a real, real hard time. In fact, I, I don't know that I can do it with just straight blind faith. And it seems like a lot of the a lot of the message of traditional church is you just got to believe it's there. We'll tell you some stories that might relate to you, but in the end, you just got to believe it's there. Mm -hmm. And and I don't necessarily buy that. You know, I personally. You know, I'll, I'll use the burn accident as an example. And this is a chapter I wrote in the book that people can read, but I'll just tell it anyway. <laughs> I had a million people come up to me when they were when they were visiting me in the hospital. And they used to infuriate me by saying, well, the Lord must have been looking out for you. And my answer was always, well, he must have blinked. Because, <laughs> you, you know, I... I I don't care what I did wrong in the past. Nothing seemed like it was worth that level of pain and that level of hurt. Nothing. And, you know, but it, by saying that, I, I was resentful at the people. I wasn't resentful at the God. And, and I had my God, I had my hate God moment. I did. You know, I definitely, everybody does. You know, when you're going through something like that, you have that moment where you question you know, what could be, what could be, what could I have done that could have allowed this kind of torture to hit me? Mm -hmm. But in the end, in the end, I had to really think about it. And for me personally, I think that God had a big influence on me getting through it, but not in the traditional sense, not in the, not in the Jesus shows up with a couple of loaves of bread and feeds 5,000 people way, mm -hmm. not in the fish jumping in the boat way. It was more in the God made me into the person that I was at the time of the accident, which made me hard and tough and willing to fight through anything. And without that, I, I, I looked at God and God's will and whatnot as much more of a guidance to me mm -hmm. than I did a puppet master pulling some strings. You know, it was more of a guide that led me to having the type of personality to get through my accident. And truth be told, there's a lot of people that get much less hurt than I did that don't make it. You know, they just, they, they die. They roll over and quit. Mm -hmm. And, and I really feel, I really feel like there was a, there was a part of getting through my accident that was very spiritual, you know, and that's a, that's a weird it's a weird thing to try and explain. I don't know if I did it real well right here, or not, but that's that's honestly how I feel. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that makes a lot of sense. That I think too many people look for a burning bush, but when they look right. at the historical context of so many scriptures, and you realize that that that's something that happens once every millennia, something that mm -hmm. that obvious, and that mm -hmm. you know it. I, I forget where I heard this, but it was some priest, and he said that, you know, God speaks in whispers. He doesn't speak through miracles very often, and I, right. that's sort of what it sounds like you're saying is that, you know, you you had sort of the the whisper to get you through, 
as opposed to, you know, some big miraculous event that everybody seems to tout because that's the easy thing to say when you're in a situation where somebody is hurt. Right. No, you're, that, that's 100% it, man. It's just, it, it's people, the, the general person, I don't think understands religion or there's or either that or there's so many different messages that it's uh, that it's all been blurred up at this point you know you know the and, and there's a big part of that too with so many different strains of religion that that go in and it confuses people and you know people that that say well you can only believe this if you're this or you can only believe that if you're that and the televangelists and the you know the crackpot evangelists that you know pull the cancer out of you by saying you're healed and there's so many different versions out there that it makes it hard to take any of it seriously. And, and I, I think that people truthfully, I, I think people don't, don't look inward enough at themselves to make a choice. Anyway, the easiest choice for most people today is to say, ah, it's all bullshit. It's all fake. You know, none of it's real because I can't see it. Mm-hmm. And that's fortunate truth that we live in today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I think they really, what they focus on is things are just so black and white. You can't look at things for so many people as being sort of a, a a sort of gray area where there's a lot of different interpretations. And I think that one of the things that drives me the most crazy is for a lot of believers, they only take specific verses and not the context of those verses from the Bible as their way of, I I don't know, feeling better and not realizing that what they're saying maybe is actually making things worse. Right. Yeah. No, or, or they weaponize it. And that's the worst thing you can do to somebody that's not even somebody that's not, that's a non-believer, but somebody that's teetering, Mm -hmm. somebody that's teetering, unsure what they believe the worst thing you can do to to uh to make them appreciate and i'll just use the word appreciate i'm not going to say believe or disbelieve but Mm -hmm. to appreciate god you have to you have to have a comfort level and you know i'll give you an example my my ex used to use forgiveness at me all the time all the time because i was an angry guy and i and Admittedly, I I've been known to hold grudges way more than most people. Yeah, you know, I, I I had a grudge with my parents. I didn't speak to them not a word for twelve years. You know, not a single word. Wow. And and she wanted me to fix that, and she would always throw scripture at me, and she'd be like, "See, the, this is what the Bible says: is forgiveness, forgiveness, and you're going to go to hell." And you know that to to somebody. To somebody that is hardened, that's not a threat. That's like a, okay, that's a challenge. Well, I'm going to choose against you. Don't give me an ultimatum, mm-hmm. you know? And, and you know, with, without getting overly religious, there's only, there's only two beings that are supposed to be able to give you an ultimatum. And none, neither of them are a person. You know, they're both, they're, they're both very, they're, they're spirits, whether it's Satan or God. And yeah. you take... Oh, you take the ult- you take the challenge, you take the whatever side of the ultimatum you choose based on your belief system. A person giving you an ultimatum, 99% of us are going to choose against the person mm-hmm. because that's what we all do. That's just how we're all wired to be rebellious against somebody telling us that they know more than us. Mm-hmm. And and that was that was one of the biggest challenges that, that I had spiritually, not just with my ex-wife, but just in general, was, you know, you go in and you, you talk about things that you've done that you want forgiveness for or what or whatnot. And, and even the pastors will say, well, you have to do this. And it's like, no, I really don't. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I could probably be a better person if I did that, but don't dictate it at me. Like, don't, don't be so it's it's my way or the highway because you know like everybody else it'll be the highway yeah and, and that's not everybody i know i'm much more stubborn than most people but that's honestly how i've always looked at it and, you know the best pastor that i ever had when i was when i was a church guy was just a you know he welcomed discussion 
he welcomed discourse. He welcomed challenge. And he never would bring it at, well, you know, this is, he used to talk all the time about how some of his deacons, some of his deacons in his church were, were not really good Christians because they would come in and they'd be, you know, smelling of booze or whatever. But he wouldn't tell them, he wouldn't say, well, you can't be a deacon anymore if you do this again. You know, he, mm-hmm. he, left, he made the point known, well, you can't really do this or you shouldn't really do this. But in the end, he wanted them to be, he wanted them to find their way. And mm-hmm. for many, they found their way. And, that, and you know, I always thought this guy was the best pastor I'd ever experienced just because he put the message out there without preaching the message out there. And there's, you know, I know that sounds weird that a, a, pastor, a pastor that doesn't preach, but, you know, there was, there was a lot of strength in what that guy did. And, yeah, and I, I think a lot of pastors could learn from that. Yeah, I agree, because I, a lot of the pastors I grew up with were very much the sort of my way or the highway kind of guys you were describing, and mm-hmm. we, um, my wife and I, we actually teach the uh, children's Sunday school at the church we're at, but the reason we like the church is because the pastor, he is very, very big on saying stuff like shame off you, that you, you should not be shamed for past discretions or current discretions, you know, that that things are going to happen, life is going to happen, and that that does not disconnect you from your walk with God. And so he's the same way. He's very open to the idea of, if you have a question and I don't have the answer, I'll tell you I don't have the answer, because it, what good is it going to do to lie to you? And then you find out that, you know, scripturally speaking, I had no idea what the fuck I was talking about. Right, exactly. And, and you know, there, there's everybody has... Everybody has an interpretation, and there's only one interpretation, and it, it's it it really is not based. You know, I, I I've always thought this. It it's really based. It should be based on doing your best to being a good care a a good caring person, and b to your your personal one on one relationship with God, mm-hmm. and. For so many people, they look for ways. Again, it's almost like it's it's almost like religion was the original social media. You know, it, it literally, it, it really is like that because very much like social media, you put out anything and then you get a hundred people to come and poke holes in it and tell you why you're full of shit. Yeah. You know, and and religion is the is the all time originate that. It was a message that was put out to the masses, and then and then hordes of people just came to smash it. It it, it literally was it was the original Facebook, it was the original Twitter, and it's 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 nonsensical that you if you if you are a believer in God that you would give any person any person that kind of power over defining your belief system. That mm-hmm. makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah, I I completely agree because the idea is sort of similar to I I think it was Lewis Black made uh he made a joke years ago about doctors having general rules of health but not taking in but so much of the medical community doesn't take into the account the fact that we're all individuals with different biologies and that some of these general w- rules are not going to work and I feel like that kind of applies to any kind of a religious belief system is that you know you are going to have a different system uh, versus the guy sitting next to you and that your right. own personal walk with God is most likely going to be different from pretty much everybody else. But for one guy to come in and tell you, you have to be within this parameter and this parameter is really limiting and frankly, bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah you're, you're right. I mean, it, it is, it, it, it's just, I, I think that, especially in 2020, people have just lost their way on on any belief system. I, I mean, I don't know that anybody believes anything. Or not, I, I guess that's too blanket a statement, but I don't think most people believe in anything. And I think I think the number of people that believe in extremist stuff just because they feel scared is is way high you know, is, is higher and, and just the, the regular day to day Christian population is probably the lowest it's ever been because, mm-hmm. 
because, you know, for one thing, if you, you can't even say that you're, a, that you're, you know, you're a Christian anymore without some kind of backlash, without some asshole telling you why you're stupid. Yeah. You know, you can't say that anymore. And that doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, Bible thumping and, and, you know, saying, well, you know, that reminds me of the book of Luke. And, you, you know, you don't have to be that, you know, everybody now we've so polluted it that, you know, I don't know when I was growing up in the eighties, when I was, you know, when I was going to church and when I was doing church with my grandmother and stuff like that, you know, there was a sense of pride that came with that. There was a sense of, of I'm trying to be a good person, mm -hmm. you know, there, and, and that was one of the ways it wasn't the only way, but that was one of the ways that you showed that you were trying to be a, a good person. Now, that is so ostracized because what people associate to religion is the total extremist nonsense. You know, when you say you're a good Christian these days, 99% of people think that you're, you know, some, some suburb, subservient uh, piece of the Westboro Baptist Church. Right. You know, they think you're like that extreme. And if you say, like, if Muslims say that they're Muslim, people automatically think that they're Mohammed Atta's cousin. You know, that mm -hmm. it's so, it's so, and, and everybody's free to believe what they want. But, you know, it's, it's ironic that we live in a time where saying that you're an atheist is better received than saying, you know what, I believe in the Ten Commandments. And that, and that does, like, you know, and, and I'll say that one point blank. I'm not the most religious guy in the world. I'm really not. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you, if you mold your life around the Ten Commandments, you're not going to do too bad. You right. know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be a fairly decent person. You don't have to be religious to understand thou shall not kill and don't sleep with your neighbor's wife and, you know, the, you know, the basics of the Ten Commandments. That's just being a good person, whether you're a... Uh, atheist or a christian or a muslim or a presbyterian or a lutheran it doesn't matter you know people have taken the word and the they've taken the word religion and they've turned it into something that just isn't what it's supposed to be anymore you know it, it, it's such a it, it's such what religion the word religion is supposed to mean is much closer to what the term community means now, mm -hmm. you know, where, where community is kind of, you know, what, what we rely on. You rely on your community to prop you up and you rely on your community to, you know, to get you through and to help you or, you, you know, you, you try to assimilate to a community that shares your own ideals. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you say that you're a part of a community. Nobody, nobody bats an eye, re regardless of what the community believes. You say that you're part of a religion. Everybody's like, "Hold on, man! Don't don't try and preach that at me. Don't spit that at me." Yeah, suddenly you're a flat yeah. earther. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, it goes to the to the upteenth level, and it's really, really a shame because what it does, you know. And again, I, I'm as I've said numerous times, I'm not the most religious guy in the world, but I hate I hate more than anything that so many people are run away from leading their lives with good ideals and good intention because they're scared of being labeled as a word. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, the people associate being called religious the same as they, they, they associate being called a racist. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. And that's just sad that, you know, something that, that is based on the ultimate of good based on the ultimate of trying to, be good has been ostracized to a level of being considered as almost the most heinous that it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's sad because everything behind the Bible and behind the, the teachings of Christ and it, it is the idea that you're supposed to love and help each other. And it, it, I find it just wildly ironic that, when I tell somebody that I'm a Christian, that I'm immediately associated with that lunatic who was telling everybody he's going to cure them of coronavirus when he put his hand on the television. Right. right. It's so, it just doesn't make sense, you know. It doesn't make sense that that people will take a word that has been just mis, 
misdefined and associate such nonsense to it. You know, I, that's why I, I always tell people, just try and live a good life. You know, if you try and try and live a good life and, and see where the cards fall, you know, because in the end, it, you know, just like I was saying, if you follow the commandments, you've got a pretty good chance if there is an afterlife of going to the right place. Right. And as, and, and, and without turning all spiritual, as somebody that has been cooked, I can tell you for a fact, you, you, if there is a, if there is a hell that is burning on, on in fire, you don't want to be there. You know, <laughs> right. I can tell you. I can tell you from experience that's not pleasant. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine that you've definitely got a, a, at least a um, a lecture or two that you could explain to some people that is like, yeah, this would but, suck. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. It's really not a lot of fun, and to be doing it twenty four seven every single day and not dying from it, ugh, that would be brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I I couldn't imagine. Like I even at this point, I'm not even sure if I believe in a hell anymore. But if it's, right. yeah, if it's like that, ugh, yeah, I, I definitely think me just being a decent dude in the course of a day is worth the price of admission to not have to fucking go there. Yeah, I'm with you, man. 100%. <laughs> well, Chris, uh, I appreciate it, man. I'm going to let you go. I, I've, I've, you've given me more time and more answers than I really thought you would uh, be <laughs> able to. So I appreciate it. Hey, I'm a talker, man. I can talk about anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before you go, can you uh, tell everybody where to, to find your books? I was going to actually get into your books and whatnot, but they might as well just read them uh, uh, themselves. You know, where uh, where can they find them? They can find them. Um, they're obviously on Amazon. Uh, my last name is Aiken, A-K-I-N. There is There are six of them that are out there. There's um, Little Victories, which is about divorce. There's Call Me Chris about my burn accident. There's... Um, my cause and effect series books, um, which are about albums that changed rock music fans' opinions of bands. Um, the three that I've done so far has been Judas Priest's Turbo, the Black Album from Metallica, and Motley Crue's self-titled album with John Karabi on vocals. Oh, yeah, and that's a great book. I read that. That was awesome. Thank you. And then the last one is the um, is not for the, the people that are good person inclined. That one is called um, And Other Things I Should Not Say, which is about my wild running around and exploits in um, Korea when I was in the military. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a massive departure from the other books. It's a, There's there's no self-help oh, there whatsoever. None. Absolute zero. But but it was fun to write and I needed some I needed to I needed something fun to write. And it's something that, you know, doing the classic metal show every week and people hear in my stories. People asked me for years to write it, so I finally did. Right, yeah. And, I mean, it's always good to, you know, to, to change things up a little bit. You know, if, if people are used to something and, you know, throwing them a bit of a curveball, especially something like that, I mean, no one's going to balk at some sort of a debaucherous story. They're not going to be like, oh, this is terrible. I want to go back to all the serious stuff. Right, exactly. So, and I'll write more. I'll probably write some more serious stuff coming in the in the years to come. So, you know, it's just this is my departure for the moment. So right. there's more to come. All right. Well, I'll look forward to it, man. And I, again, I appreciate you taking a minute and I'll be uh, listening this evening when you guys uh, go on air. All right. Sounds great, man. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. You talk to, I'll talk to you later. All right, man. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
So that's going to do it for another episode of the Rock God Podcast. I want to thank Chris for taking the time to come on and talk to us with his awesome and very interesting opinions. I want to thank Lords of Mace for allowing us to use their music to put on this podcast this week. Go check out theclassicmetalshow.com where Chris and Wendell Neely host every Saturday night from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Also go to Chris Aiken Books if you'd like to read any of his interesting stories. That's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, A-K-I-N dot com. Also make sure to check out all of our social media, Facebook, Heavy Vinyl and Cassettes, Instagram, Heavy Vinyl Records, Twitter, at Vinyl Heavy. Also go to heavy-vinyl.com. This week we've got some pre-orders on the old Doom Band Winters Into Darkness. And we also will be getting the session demos from the old 80s death metal band Master. So go over there and check that out and pick them up. Anyway, thank you for tuning in again and God bless. (laughs) 